Hello everyone, uh, I'm Matthew Gallant. I'm a video game designer. I work at Naughty Dog in Santa Monica, California. Um, I think I might have put too many of my points in my intro there, but uh, I worked on these two games, The Last of Us Part II, I was the lead systems designer, and I uh, then got a chance to be the game director on The Last of Us Part I. Uh, if you're not familiar with The Last of Us, uh, the franchise has sold through more than uh, 37 million copies as of December 2022. The games are known for their storytelling and for their characters, for their uh, gameplay and music and audio and all sorts of things, but they're also known for their accessibility. Uh, the Last of Us Part II, as uh, David mentioned, shipped with over 60 accessibility features and was notable for being uh, a AAA game that was completable by someone who was completely blind. So I've talked about accessible game design uh, to a game developer audience before and kind of gotten into very specific points there. I'm trying something a little different in this talk. I'm wanting to just um, bring up the more general design principles for designing for accessibility. Like what can be broadly learned from what we did on The Last of Us. And my uh, talk has two main theses. The first is that disability is a design choice. And the second is that the benefits of accessibility extend to everyone. So that's what I'm here to uh, try to convince you today. So I'll jump right in. Disability is a design choice. This is probably a mildly uncomfortable assertion to make. It kind of pushes back against a common sense understanding of disability. This is often called the medical model of disability. And this view would say that like, the problem here is in the impairment itself. The, the eye that can't see, the ear that can't hear, the leg that can't walk. Um, in this view, disability is something caused by trauma or impairment, and it's localized within individuals, and it kind of abstracts away any responsibility that designers have towards it. I think the flaws of this model become apparent when you contrast it with uh, what is called the social model of disability. Uh, this is a term coined by the activist Mike Oliver in the 1980s. He was kind of distilling ideas that were bubbling within the disability rights movement at the time. The social model of disability says that if a wheelchair user can't use the stairs, the problem is the stairs. If a deaf person can't follow along with the video, the problem is the lack of subtitles in the video. So this view places the disability within the built environment, within the designed object, the failure of the built environment to meet the needs of its user, that is what causes disability. And if you look at it this way, it makes it very clear that designers have a responsibility to either create or remove barriers in the products that we create. Uh, to quote, oh, sorry. To quote Judith Human, disability only becomes a tragedy when society fails to provide the things we need to lead our lives. Job opportunities or barrier-free buildings, for example. It is not a tragedy to me that I'm living in a wheelchair. So let's give designers the benefit of the doubt. Um, none of us mean to put barriers in the products that we make, but those barriers end up there. How does that happen? Uh, my hypothesis is that it comes about when we make assumptions about our users, about our players, and then those assumptions get baked into the designed object. I have a few examples here. Uh, what assumptions is this staircase making about its user? This is the easy round. It's assuming that you can stand on one foot and lift your other foot onto the landing, that you can walk up the stairs, essentially. But we can go further than that. We can look at the length of the staircase and say that it's making certain assumptions about the user's stamina. Uh, this staircase has railings, but if it didn't, it'd be making certain assumptions about the user's balance. Uh, credit to Bryce Johnson for this example. Um, what assumptions does a video game controller make about its user? Well, it assumes that you can press and reach all the different buttons and joysticks and touchpad that you're probably doing so with your fingers. Uh, it makes the assumption that you have the strength to lift the controller, that you have the stamina to mash buttons or to hold down buttons, that you have pre the precision to only press the inputs that you want. Uh, going further, what does an action game like The Last of Us assume about its user? Well, not only does it assume all the things I just mentioned about the controller, but it assumes that you can see the screen, that you can read the text that's on the screen, that you can hear when an enemy's sneaking up on you, 
Um, it makes certain assumptions about uh, like cognitive faculties that you can um, process all the information that's coming in in this you know, fast-paced game, that you can remember mechanics that you learned many hours ago. It even makes very specific assumptions about like how we can move the controller, uh, move the camera without causing motion sickness. So it was assumptions of this nature that first brought accessibility to uh, the studio's attention at Naughty Dog. Uh, a player by the name of Josh Straub reached out to the studio because he was frustrated. He had played all the way through, or almost all the way through, one of the Uncharted games, and it hit a barrier right at the end of the game that he couldn't progress past. I have a short video talking about this. Director, Could I get audio director. on the video, please? And I explained to them what Josh had explained to me, which was like he, he loved Uncharted, huge Uncharted fan. He couldn't beat Uncharted 2 because there's a series of doors if the button mash through at the end. I, ha I was faced with the reality that I had played this entire game. I had spent $60 on it, and I could not get any further without the help, without the help of an able-bodied person. So... The designers who made that sequence in Uncharted, they had really noble intentions. They wanted to make an exciting action set piece at the end of the game, you know, end the game with an, a thrilling sequence. But they made an assumption. They made the assumption that mashing a button was something the player could do. That wasn't true for players like Josh. So a design decision inadvertently became a barrier. So we've talked about some examples here of, you know, when assumptions get baked into a design. What would the opposite of that look like? What would it look like if we were to design without assumptions? Uh, I have a couple of examples that I think point towards what that could look like. Uh, the first comes from the world of web design. To vastly oversimplify things, uh, you know, uh, websites were originally designed with the assumption that they would be viewed on uh, computer monitors. And that gave designers assumptions they could make about the screen size and the aspect ratio and stuff like that. And then along came smartphones, and all those websites looked really terrible on a cramped screen. Uh, the initial response was to make, you know, mobile versions of websites, but even that broke down once we added iPads and different sized phones and ultra-wide monitors. And it very quickly got to the point where web designers could not reasonably make assumptions about what screen their content would be displayed on. Hence the idea of responsive web design, that web designers make websites that are flexible and adaptive and adapt to whatever screen the user brings. They're, we're not making assumptions anymore about what screen the content is going to be displayed on. Another example comes from the world of PC gaming. Uh, we just released The Last of Us Part 1 on PC, and a lot of players with disabilities prefer playing games on PC because they've created um, hardware rigs for themselves, input devices that are customized to their needs, and they want to be able to take those devices from game to game. Um, one of the kind of implicit assumptions of a controller, especially in a console game, is that when the game receives a button input, that that input is coming from a physical button. A physical button gets pressed, the game receives a button input. It's one-to-one. -one. That isn't necessarily true on a PC. For one, PCs support a, a vast range of input devices, not only the more standard mouse and keyboard and controller, but also things like uh, head switches or sip and puff devices. Furthermore, when these devices are registered in the OS, they don't necessarily need to come through as a special input device. There's a lot of utility software and hardware out there that basically makes these devices indistinguishable when they come through to the game. So the game doesn't need to make any assumptions that a button press came from a button. A button press, virtualized, could have come from anything, from any number of devices. And this is, offers a lot more flexibility for players with disabilities. This actually becomes even more powerful when you look at things like macros. So this is the idea that one physical input could um, trigger a whole set of pre-programmed outputs on the game side. So responsive web kind of points towards what it would look like to do output without assumptions. Flexible virtualized PC controls show what it looked like to do input without assumptions. So thinking this way, designing this way, what is the outcome, you know, what is the result on an actual product? What changes in the way that you're designing? Um, I have some examples from Naughty Dog's game to kind of look at the history here. Um, our first game with an accessibility menu built in was Uncharted 4, released in 2016. Uh, credit to uh, Alex Neonike and Amelia Schatz, who p pushed this uh, forward at the studio and, and really leveled up our game in terms of accessibility. You can see here Uncharted 4 had a one-page accessibility menu, and there it is, an option to turn repeated button presses into a button hold. So that's great. That removes the barrier that Josh encountered and gives players a way to get through that sequence in a different way. 
In fact, this whole menu is full of great uh, motor accessibility options. You can see here there's an option to, um, rather than hold down a button to aim, you can press once to start aiming and then press again to stop aiming. So that reduces uh, fatigue for players who don't want to hold down a button. There's an option here where normally when you play the game, the left stick controls the character and the right stick controls the camera. Uncharted 4 had an option to only control the camera with one stick and have the camera automated and point towards the direction of movement automatically. So we were really excited by this. We were so um, thrilled to have all these accessibility options. So we wanted to go even further on The Last of Us Part Two, And we started prototyping and developing features for, you know, more for features for motor accessibility, for hearing accessibility, and especially for vision accessibility. We ended up with over 60 accessibility options. They, they no longer fit on one page. So we had six different accessibility submenus grouped by functionality. And then you know, some players wanted to be able to turn on all the options that were going to be relevant for them in one, uh, one swoop. So we had these accessibility presets. But we were worried about this. This was unprecedented territory for us. Um, we were worried that this was a lot of complexity to expose to the player. Would it be confusing? Would it be overwhelming? Would players get lost in these menus, not be able to find the functionality that they want? Would they um, turn on something they didn't mean to and then get confused? We were also coming at this from the mindset that we had designed a lot of our accessibility features to work together. They're kind of a complete package. They work together holistically. Did it make any sense to separate them and to offer them piecemeal? Thankfully, we worked with an amazing team of accessibility consultants on The Last of Us Part Two, and we got to ask them these questions. What, what did they think about this? And they were unambiguous and unanimous that offering this level of flexibility was the right approach for players with disabilities. Um, one anecdote in particular really resonated with me. Um, James Rath, who you see there in the center in the red shirt, uh, James is legally blind, uh, and he's also a documentary filmmaker. And he was talking to us about how he uses his iPhone quite a bit in everyday situations and in his work. It's a very powerful tool for him, and it has a lot of, lot of customization. And he showed us how big the accessibility menu is on the iPhone. It's gigantic. If you have an iPhone in your pocket, you know, feel free to come check it out. It has tons of options and tweaks and customizations for, players who, uh, for users with disabilities. And this really reassured me of three things. The first is that you know, here was a real-life example of a very um, customizable tool that someone was taking great advantage of and was really appreciating all the customization it offered. The other fact it showed me was that this would not be a stumbling block to less technical users. Because frankly, my mom has an iPhone and she loves it, and she never accidentally goes into the accessibility menu and starts turning on options that aren't relevant for her. And third, it showed me that you know, a company that has a reputation for you know, beautiful, minimalist designs didn't shy away from exposing this much complexity to the user, that they saw the value in this for accessibility. Um, this anecdote shows other, two other important facets of accessible design that I'll touch on very briefly, because I'm watching the time go down here. <laughs> the first is nothing about us without us. You may have heard this in uh, Kim Goodwin's talk as well. Um, you know, when we were developing these accessibility features, most of the people working on The Last of Us are able-bodied people. But we didn't let that stop us from, you know, trying to imagine what kind of barriers players might encounter. So we could try playing with the audio off, playing with the screen off or with our eyes closed, playing the game with one hand. All of these could give us some sense of what barriers might exist in our game. But the important thing is that we didn't stop there. Once we had done those initial prototypes, we invited in our accessibility consultants, our players with disabilities, to come play these options and to give us their feedback, to let us know what's working for them, what isn't, what, what could be better. Um, this feedback was incredibly valuable, and that's, uh, you know, the, the expression, nothing about us without us, is about um, bringing people with disabilities into your design process when you're designing for accessibility. The other one, again, I'll touch on briefly, start early. Um, when I, I mentioned that when our accessibility consultants were coming in, they were playing early prototypes. That's because we were doing this first round of testing two years before the game shipped. If you know anything about game development, games look really rough really early two years before they ship. But getting this feedback this early meant that we got to deeply integrate the feedback into our UI systems, into our control systems. All of this feedback would have been much more expensive to plan for and develop and engineer if we tried to do it later in development. 
So first thesis here, disability is the design choice. You can overcome it by recognizing what assumptions you're making about your users, by embracing extensive customization, nothing about us without us, involve people with disabilities in your design process, and start early, because that only makes it cheaper. So my, my second uh, point today, the benefits of accessibility extend to everyone. So I think there can be a, a, a notion that you know, the benefits, obviously accessibility is important, but that the benefits kind of only accrue to a small number of people, and, and only to those people. And I want to push back against that narrative. Um, firstly, because people with disabilities are not a small percentage of the population. The CDC estimates that about one in four adults in the US have some kind of disability. The WHO puts that figure at one in six worldwide have, have someone, people have significant disability. This is a lot of people. This is very, very large, you know, millions, billions of people who every day have to face, you know, a built environment and services and institutions that may or may not have been designed with their needs in mind. Um, it's also true that um, we all face the prospect of disability as we age because age affects our eyesight, our hearing, our, our motor and cognitive abilities. Um, I often think in, in you know, my line of work, that wouldn't it be tragic if the generation that grew up playing video games lost, lost access to that because of a failure to account for accessibility as we all age. It's also worth noting that you know, when we think about accessibility, we often think about people with permanent conditions. But these same conditions can manifest in ways that are temporary or situational. A classic example that's often given is someone might be doing something with one hand because they are permanently one-handed. Or it could be a temporary condition where their arm is in a cast. Or it could even be a, you know, a very specific situational condition, like their other hand is holding a drink, or holding a sleeping baby, or they have it wrapped around a loved one. But all these people benefit from accessibility features that were designed to help people with permanent conditions. This is often referred to as the curb cut effect. I'm sure you're familiar with curb cuts, those little divots in the sidewalk. They are there for wheelchair users to be able to mount from the road onto the sidewalk. But I'm sure you know from personal experience, they're used for way more uses than that. People with baby carriages, people with delivery carts, uh, people with bicycles or scooters. There's a whole range of people that benefit from a feature that was designed for accessibility. And we found this to be true in our own game as well. Um, an example is uh, scavenging. A big part of playing The Last of Us is going through you know, abandoned buildings and scavenging for supplies. And you do so by walking up to the items and hitting triangle to grab them. But we noticed in our user testing that this could be fatiguing for players. So we offered the option of doing auto pickup, where you just walk up to the items and they'd be grabbed automatically. We designed this feature for accessibility. But after the game came out, a journalist of Forbes put out an article saying that he recommended this setting for everyone, that it just made the game better, it automated an action. That's totally legitimate, and I'm, I'm glad that that benefited them. Another example is our high contrast display. This is a feature that we designed for players with low vision to help um, separate background elements from the foreground, you know, the character and the enemies. Uh, we did this as a vision accessibility feature, but we found that tons of other people found other uses for it. For instance, some people used it as kind of a cognitive accessibility feature. If they wanted to focus on the important elements in the scene and kind of drown out some of the noise, other people just liked using it as kind of a soft hint system if they wanted to find collectibles or needed help um, solving a puzzle. And my favorite use is that YouTubers very quickly discovered that this makes a very convenient editing mask. Truthfully, our own editorial team takes advantage of this as well. So I could go on and on about all the different ways that I've seen our accessibility features be used in ways we didn't expect, but the takeaway is this. Accessibility benefits everyone, not only the 16 to 26 percent of people who have disabilities, but all of us as we face the prospect of disabilities, we age, people in temporary or situational conditions, and of course, the curb cut effect. It's very difficult to anticipate the ways in which your features will be used. Uh, so these have been my two uh, theses for the day. Disability is the design choice, and the benefits of accessibility extend to everyone. I want to thank everyone at Naughty Dog, thank our amazing team of accessibility consultants, and thank you as well to From Business to Buttons for inviting me to speak today. Thank you. Thank you, Matthew. And thank you for making an amazing game even more amazing. Thank you. Uh, one thing I simply can't get out of my head, and I'm sure I'm not alone in this, 
is this fact that you can play The Last of Us without looking at the screen, that a blind player can play through it. Uh, so much so that I know I've nagged you to, uh, to bring a video clip and, and, and talk us through it. Yeah, so I, um, basically, oh my gosh, not quite ready for the video, sorry. To give a little bit of context here, um, when we were testing for these accessibility features, one of the tests that we used was, you know, we had to be able to beat the fight ourselves. If we couldn't beat it with our eyes closed, we saw that as an evidence that like, a blind player wouldn't be able to beat it either, because we had all the advantages. We knew the layout. We knew the design of the boss. So, so every developer who worked on uh, these combat encounters or puzzles or sections, we had to be able to prove to ourselves that it was completable. So I have a video here of me fighting a bloater, which is a boss fight in the game, and uh, showing off some of the accessibility features. Um, what you'll see in the video is I'm using uh, lock-on aim, which lines up my, uh, my gun with the enemy. I'm using uh, audio cues, so there's these cues that tell me when to dodge attacks and when I'm out of ammo and stuff like that. And I'm using navigation assistance, which is an option that points me away from danger, and I use that to run away from the enemies. So now I think we're ready for the video clip. Thank you. And I'll kind of commentate it a little bit live as I go. So the first thing I do here is I go into the Options menu, Accessibility. I turn on the Vision Accessibility preset that just turns on all the Vision Accessibility options. You'll see it puts me in high contrast mode. That doesn't actually help because I'm, I'm playing with my eyes closed. So I heard an audio cue there saying it's time to dodge. And I can hear that the bloater's near me. So I'm using navigation assistance to run away. There's another audio cue there that tells me when I have a shot lined up. So I use that to know when to fire my gun. I got an audio cue there telling me I had one bullet left in the chamber, so I switched guns and I'm, I'm running away again. So here I start to get into trouble because that was my last bullet. <laughs> Um, and there's also a runner that's coming after me as well here. So once I realize that that's what's happened, uh, I start running away and trying to get some more ammo. This is scary, even in high contrast. Yes, yes, definitely. Uh, I've managed to get some ammo here, but I can't reload my shotgun because this runner keeps attacking me, and it keeps interrupting my reload. So I eventually realize that's what's happening, and I, I start running away again. I think finally, somewhere around here, I'm finally able to reload the shotgun. 20 health total, 43. There goes the runner. <laughs> Down to my last bullets again, but on my last shot, managed to do it. <laughs> So if you had no sense of how um, a blind player would play that fight, I hope like, that gave you some idea. <laughs> What's the feedback from blind players playing this? Oh, I mean, the reaction to the accessibility features has been tremendous across the board. Just in incredible stories from fans, um, players reaching out and saying that they, you know, maybe they thought they'd lost contact with a hobby that they loved and, and getting to play a game like this. Uh, getting to play it on their own is, is so important. Um, yeah, nothing, you know, I, I, I work on many aspects of game design, but nothing makes me prouder than, than hearing from players who are able to, to play these games and enjoy them and appreciate them with their loved ones. Um, no, it's been absolutely thrilling. That's fantastic. <laughs> A big round of applause for Matthew Gallon. Thank you. Thank you so much.